Thanks, Sophie. You're watching Southeast Today. Our top story tonight. Police crackdowns on drug gangs are not working, says a recovering user. You cannot get rid of drugs. What you can do is you can do more for the addict. 27 lives lost and independent inquiries ordered into the UK's most deadly migrant boat incident. Another pinch me moment for Brighton fans now in Amsterdam watching the Seagulls take a European giant. We're live at the stadium as the game is underway. And sustainable memories crafting crocheted poppies to mark Remembrance Day. Welcome to the programme, I'm Ellie Crissell. A recovering drug user has told the BBC police crackdowns on drug gangs are not working, as the criminal networks are too deeply rooted in Sussex. Jeff Ashman was addicted to heroin and cocaine for 24 years before going into recovery in January. The 52-year-old who slept rough in Hastings admits he became a prolific shoplifter to feed his habit. As our special correspondent Colin Campbell reports, Jeff believes there needs to be greater focus on helping addicts get off drugs. I never thought I'd get out of it. I didn't think, and I really wanted to get out of it. But I knew there was more to live for. For 24 years, Jeff used heroin and cocaine. I stopped counting when I got to about 50 people that aren't here with me in Hastings anymore because of they've overdosed. And that, it hit me really hard. And that's going on today. It's going to go on tomorrow. Ravaged by drugs, this is the 52-year-old in January, the day he entered rehab. There was not a lot left structurally on my body because opiates and the lifestyle of addiction had stripped me like a chicken. But when you're driven by a, by, by a demonic chemical, which saturates all your cells, your thought process, your receptors. The only voice you can hear is your addiction. But his break came from Hastings Charity, the Seaview Project. How easy was it to get Jeff into recovery? Well, it took a long time and there was concerted effort by, you know, different agencies that we work in partnership with. Jeff's kind of um, experience, you know, I think is invaluable. He's already telling other people, you know, that, that recovery is possible. Hastings is one of 13 areas in England and Wales hardest hit by drugs misuse. And for the last couple of years, the town's been receiving extra central government funding through Project ADA, a multi-agency campaign that aims to crack down on the drugs gangs that operate here, but also provide help and support to the people who use drugs. Government knows it faces an unavoidable choice. Invest in tackling the problem or keep paying the consequences. How did you fund it? It was prolific shoplifting. It was the easiest form to earn a pound note and the safest and the most way to not ever be nicked. Sorry to say that. And how much money were you needing to make each day? Minimum of a hundred pounds, a hundred pounds a day. But you were stealing hundreds of pounds worth of... Yeah, I mean, to, to have a hundred pounds from Nick Goods, I would have to have a retail value of about 600 pounds worth to clear a hundred pounds. Jeff's been jailed four times in four years for shoplifting. He says he's determined to make amends for the harm he caused. The police say they're having a positive effect in tackling drug-related harm and crime in Hastings. Does it make any difference, the police cracking down on county lines gangs, do you think? It's not working because they would, they would slow it down for a day or two when they do their interceptions. And that market line is so valuable and established that someone will avoid a vacuum. Someone, someone will come straight back. Not even back, they're already here. There's layers and layers and layers of these people now. So you can't get rid of the drugs? You cannot get rid of the drugs. What you can do is you can do more 
for the addict that doesn't know that they have the ability to surrender. For Jeff, surrendering and seeking help has been transformative. I have a partner, I'm back in touch with all my children. I've got my house back, I've got an absolutely beautiful home. I, I, I was able to do that by, by the support of the services. Rehab has also, it seems, been life-saving. I'm glad I got out when I got out on the 9th of January 2023, because where are we today, November 2023, 10 months on, I possibly would be dead now. And our special correspondent joins us now. Colin, tell us about how the drugs industry is taking so many lives. Well, Ellie, drug-related deaths in Hastings have fallen from 15 in 2020 to 2021 and to 11 deaths in 2022 to 23. Now, over the same period, Sussex Police say there were 24 fatal drug overdoses across East Sussex. But there are fears drug deaths could be about to rise nationally. I think it's really important to recognise that that we're not worried there's going to be a drug-related death crisis in the UK. There already is a drug-related death crisis in the UK. Um, we haven't done everything we need to, to manage that problem, and it's likely that, well, we're very worried that things are going to get worse because of the penetration of synthetic drugs into the UK's drug supply. Sussex Police say in the last three years they've dismantled 300 county line drugs lines, removed more than £2 million worth of drugs from the streets and arrested more than 850 people for drug trafficking and or weapons offences. I accept that you take out one line quite quickly, those lines um, do, um, do get replaced by other lines. However, we do need to keep on top of it because if we don't um, what we see is those, when those lines become more established, inevitably serious violence goes up, that the exploitation of vulnerable people goes up, the legitimising of those profits, of those drug-related profits go up. Well, Jeff feels his life has been saved. He's deeply remorseful for the harm he caused, not just to his loved ones, but to all of those he stole from to feed his habit, for which he says he will make amends. Ellie. Thank you, Colin. And uh, if you've been affected by the subject we've just been discussing, you can find support from the BBC Action Line website. An independent inquiry into the UK's deadliest migrant boat incident has been ordered by the government. At least 27 people, including a pregnant woman and three children, died when their boat sank in the Channel in 2021. It comes as a report into that tragedy found that the rescue effort was confused by the number of other boats making the crossing at the time and staffing levels were insufficient to oversee the operation. Piers Hopkirk reports. It is believed to be the worst disaster involving migrants trying to cross the English Channel. It was a tragedy that made headlines across the world. The death of at least 27 people aboard an overcrowded and sinking inflatable boat. The worst maritime disaster in the Channel for 30 years. I just want to say that I'm shocked and appalled and deeply saddened by the loss of life. But... These the faces of the victims. Today's report by the Marine Accident Investigation Branch revealed it took 12 hours from the first distress call to locate them with the UK's response hampered by low visibility, a lack of resources and poor communication with the French. What we need to do is we need to think about why this happened, why, why, why was the Coast Guard, uh, have, have they been underfunded, what is the narrative around channel crossings which leads to people dying in the channel, what are the main causes of this, so that's what we need to get to the bottom of. The report found with multiple distress calls and multiple boats in the water at the time, Coast Guard operators were faced with a confusing picture and it was difficult to locate and identify discrete distressed boats. This challenge was exacerbated by the high workload on the Coast Guard operators at the Dover Maritime Rescue Coordination Centre. It also found there was a lack of dedicated aircraft conducting aerial surveillance of the Dover Strait and a lack of an effective consolidated maritime response between the Border Force and the Coast Guard. It makes for some very difficult reading um, and my thoughts are with the families of those who died in that tragic incident. The announcement of a further investigation or inquiry uh, in relation to the incidents um, I think is important to get greater clarity but 
it's equally important that the lessons that can be learned from the work that's been undertaken so far are learned. With small boat crossings continuing, the report recommends better information sharing with the French authorities and improve cooperation between the Coast Guard and Border Force. Armed with it, the Transport Secretary has announced an independent inquiry into the disaster, in his words, to give the families of the victims the clarity they deserve. Piers Hopkirk, BBC South East Today. Well, we can now speak to the MP for East Worthing and Shoreham, Tim Lawton, who's on the Home Affairs Committee and regularly reviews policy on the small boats crisis. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Is the government's small boats migration policy working? Well, it's working better than it has in the past because the figures for those who have taken that perilous uh, journey uh, in the last year is substantially down on what it was last year. Now, we haven't reached the end of the year um, yet, but the signs are there are fewer people attempting to come uh, across the channel for a multitude of reasons, including the legislation we passed uh, earlier in the uh, summer about uh, making it an illegal offence to come across the channel in that way um, now. The increased cooperation, some of the points that came out of this report today are things that have already been taken up. It's two years on from that uh, report, although there's still lessons to be uh, uh, to be learned. Better cooperation with the French police and the patrols going on um, there. So a combination of, of things has meant that the numbers have come down. But there shouldn't be anybody coming across the channel in that uh, in that way. So there's still much more work to be done. Indeed. When you say Im improvement, you have seen improvements. But I think there are lots of people who would argue that it's not enough and we are still seeing record numbers of people coming over in these small boats and there are likely to be more tragic deaths as, as we've just been hearing about. Do you need more well, radical action? Well, we're not seeing record numbers of uh, people come across. That's the point I've just made. They've, they've actually gone down at the moment, but that can change at any time. A combination of factors, the poor weather and everything else has contributed um, uh, to that. We've also, on Wednesday, crucially, we're awaiting this very important judgment from the Supreme Court about the Rwanda scheme. If that does uh, give the green light for the government to go ahead with that, I believe that will be a very serious deterrent to people uh, coming across. And we saw the evidence for that when the Home Affairs Select Committee went to uh, Calais back in uh, January. And we were told that when the Rwanda scheme was announced by the government the year before, there was a huge surge in migrants uh, in Calais approaching the French authorities to try and regularise their position because they didn't want to risk being put on a plane to Rwanda. So we know it does have a deterrent uh, effect. So there's a combination of things um, happening. But at the end of the day, we want nobody coming across the channel in that way. And we want clearer, safe and legal routes for those genuine refugees who do have a credible claim for asylum uh, in the UK, that they can come in a safe manner rather than at the hands of ruthless people, um, smugglers, profiting from this human misery that ended in this Tim. horrible tragedy back in 2021. The miracle, Ellie, I have to say, is there haven't been more cases like it. It was a very rare case, fortunately, because of the bravery and the uh, efficiency of uh, emergency services, of border force, of the Coast Guard, the, the lifeboat and, and others who prevented far greater loss of life that could have happened. Tim, unfortunately, well, we will have to leave it there. Tim Lawton, thank you for joining us this evening. A 16-year-old girl from Kent who went missing almost a month ago has been found in London. Grace Fisher from Gillingham was reported missing on the 13th of October. On Wednesday evening, she was located safe and well by police officers in Camden. Two men have been arrested in connection with her disappearance since she went missing. The inquest into the death of a nine-month-old baby from Ashford who died after choking at a nursery will be heard before a jury. Oliver Steeper died in hospital in September 2021, six days after the incident at the Jelly Beans Nursery in Kings North. An inquest into his death will be held in May next year, lasting for two weeks. Kent Police and Crime Commissioner Matthew Scott has said that he'd be worried about the safety of Kent police officers if they were deployed at the planned pro-Palestinian rally in London this Remembrance Weekend. He said Met Police Chief Mark Rowley had got it wrong in allowing the rally on Saturday and that if a similar march were to happen in Kent, he would seek permission from the Home Secretary to ban it. Sussex Police say there will be increased visibility this weekend to reassure local communities. 
The parents of a seven-year-old boy from Kent with a rare condition are advocating for a transformative new treatment to be available to other children on the NHS. The family of George Baker flew to the US to get urgent care after he failed to recover following treatment here in England. His mum Catherine says she doesn't know what their family would have done without help from overseas, as Yetande Youssef reports. Yeah. George Baker was just two and a half years old when he was diagnosed with a rare gene mutating condition which affects his liver. His mum Catherine first discovered it through a skin rash. After his second birthday, he was about two and a quarter, he changed. He started to seem a lot more tired, he became a lot more pale and he would wake up in the night every now and then with really bad tummy pain. George's parents were told he had Langerhans cell histiocytosis. The effect on his family was profound. It was as though our life had been blown up um, and turned on its head. George, yeah. stop. His parents were told his only chance of survival was through chemotherapy, but after a year of treatment, George became rapidly unwell. What did you find out from the NHS? Did they tell you that this was the only option, the chemotherapy, or did they provide any other options? No, we were told that this was the treatment. Um, there is a protocol throughout Europe, England included, and this is how they treat LCH. The condition affects up to 50 children in the UK each year. It's a cancer-like disorder damaging organs, bones or tissue, and it's more common in boys than girls. In a desperate search for a solution, Catherine found Dr Ashish Kumar online, an oncologist offering a special inhibitor drug in the US. We had already treated several children like George whose disease had uh, progressed in spite of chemotherapy. And in those children, we had used this as a last resort and it turns out that it was working much better than our expectations and had uh, literally saved many children's lives. The treatment, combined with a partial liver transplant donated by his mum, means George is now a lot more active. I'm looking forward to the when I'm older and that when I play football for my uh, local club and win the Champions League. Last month, George celebrated his seventh birthday, his sisters by his side. With a bright future ahead, the family hope many other children will be able to access the same drug that helped save George's life. Yet and day, Yusuf, BBC South East Today, Seven Oaks. It's 10 to 7. This is our top story tonight. A recovering drug user has told the BBC police crackdowns on drug gangs are not working as the criminal networks are too deeply rooted in Sussex. Also in tonight's programme, another European flight for the Seagulls as they meet Ajax in the Europa League. We'll have the very latest from Amsterdam very shortly. And after yesterday's rain, finally a bit of sunshine around today, but still some sharp showers. Will it brighten up for the weekend? We'll join me later in the programme to find out. After three years of work and a £250 million upgrade, Gatwick Railway Station will fully reopen to the public on the 21st of November. With 20 million passengers a year, it's the region's busiest station outside of London. The upgrade will make many journeys five minutes faster. Paul Clifton has been taking a look round. The new concourse looks far from ready. That's because a lot of it is covered up for protection. Within a few days, that will change. It's been a huge challenge to build a new airport concourse above an operational railway that's as busy as this, a railway that operates 24-7 and an airport that works 24-7. Eight new escalators, five new lifts, four new stairways. This is all about moving more passengers more quickly between the railway and the airport. Platforms have been widened. Outside the station, tracks have been straightened, a bottleneck fixed, with many journeys already five minutes faster than before. This station sees trains from London, Southampton, Portsmouth, Brighton and Bedford. Southern, Thameslink, Gatwick Express and the Great Western services to Guildford and Reading. 20 million passengers a year, 
a huge transformation for the station. A brighter, bigger, better Gatwick station for our passengers, but also we've really built in uh, accessibility so for people with reduced mobility um, and also arriving with you know, luggage or families just to make the experience much better. 40% of Gatwick Airport's passengers arrive by train. The ambition is to increase that figure. Paul Clifton, BBC South East Today, Gatwick Station. Now, it's another pinch-me moment for Brighton fans. Thousands of them are currently in the Johan Cruyff Arena watching the Seagulls take on Ajax. And our sports reporter, James Dunn, is live for us there this evening. Hello, James. What's the latest? What's the score? Well, it was an absolute dream start for Brighton. The man from Barcelona, Ansu Fati, whose name I have heard being absolutely exploded. And it won't just be there because I've been talking to fans in uh, pubs and uh, bars all over this city who don't have tickets and just wanted to be here because this is Thursday nights in Europe. This is Ajax and fans, many of whom have followed this club for decades, well, they want to be a part of it. Seagulls on tour in the dam. The city's overrun with Brighton fans today. Come on! And they're making the most of this incredible journey. It's just extraordinary. The football we're playing, Premier League club, to be able to take my sons with us along the way is fantastic. We've done a bit of culture. Yeah, did a few things. Van, Van Gogh Museum yesterday, we saw that. That was lovely. Yeah, now we're on the drink now. Ready for the game. Well, everywhere Brighton goes, we go. <laughs> And here we are in Amsterdam. We go on the supporters' coach quite a lot. And we, there's four or five of us, all women, old women, and our husbands don't like football. So, you know, we go on our own. <laughs> Through the narrow city streets, alongside these world-famous canals, everywhere you go in Amsterdam today, you hear the same sound. It is almost unbelievable how many Brighton fans are here. I've spoken to so many who don't even have tickets. They've just come to soak up the atmosphere, and it is quite an atmosphere. We knew this would be the biggest game with uh, fans coming over, 50 minutes on the plane, Eurostar or just driving. So there's a lot of fans here without tickets. That's fine. They're enjoying the Dutch hospitality and uh, hoping for a great game tonight. She goes. They've sent a team of us out here to assist with ticket collections, make sure the fans are okay. People seem to know what they're doing here. They do indeed, yeah. They've settled in nicely to a couple of the bars around here. Um, but no, all the locals have been so welcoming and so friendly and just really embracing what's going to happen tonight, yeah, at the stadium. For those not picking up tickets at the collection point today, celebrations in the square could last long into the night. A lot of people I know didn't even get tickets and still coming over, so I'm meeting a big group later to just have a drink and watch the game in town. It's a bit of a nightmare, mate. It's quite hurtful. I'm, I haven't got a ticket, so I'm seeing everyone get tickets. So just here, enjoy the atmosphere, a few beers, a bit of a party time, and bring home three points. He loves the Derby and Sussex Policy. His name is Ansu, Ansu Fancy. Da -da 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 -da. Showing their love for the goal scorer that helped them beat Ajax in the last leg. A win tonight gets them one step closer to progressing through the group stages and continuing this European tour. It's only 90 minutes of football, but these memories of tonight will last a lifetime. Well, the second half has kicked off now. We found out that Lewis Dunk, their captain, has been substituted. They'll be desperate to either hold on to that lead or improve on it, because if they can, then they come out of this game with seven points. And in the past, teams have progressed through the group stages to the knockout stages with fewer points than that. 45 minutes left, still all to play for. How very exciting. Enjoy, James. Yes, that second half has just kicked off and you can listen to live commentary uh, now on BBC Radio Sussex. Thousands of people are expected to gather this weekend to show their respect for those who have died in the line of duty. This year's commemorations have seen people getting creative with their poppies, from the knitted and crocheted to ornaments on cars and post boxes. Peter Whittlesey reports on the array of creations from the crafty as they have sprung up across the southeast.
In Cobham, Remembrance Day means more than just wearing a poppy. They have their own appeal for knitters to make poppies and so much more. I made a pair of army boots, knitted army boots, a soldier's head. And the base of that was a piece of artwork that my father uh, constructed. He's an artist and he's, he's, he's gone, he's, he's dead now. It requires concentration and time to reflect, stitch after stitch. Yes, you are thinking about it. You're knowing what you're doing it for. And it does make you think, yes. A lot of sacrifices and a lot of death on both sides, unfortunately, and they were only young. Displays of crocheted and knitted poppies have appeared in towns and villages across the southeast, and this Sunday they will be the colourful backdrop to many commemorations. For the WI knitters of Cobham, there's something special about doing their craft for the community. Oh, doing something for the community is just wonderful because people are so appreciative. And when we're, when we're out putting out the displays, people stop in their cars to take photographs, they communicate, children at the school, they just love it. And it just brings people together, doesn't it? And bringing people together to remember is what this weekend is all about. Peter Whittlesey, BBC South East Today, Cobham. Now, let's see what the Remembrance Weekend weather has in store for us. Rachel Mackley is here. Hello. Hello. Well, it's not looking too bad. We'll get to that in just a moment. Of course, earlier today, finally after yesterday's rain, there was a touch of sunshine. We've got a rainbow uh, to prove that we actually did see the sunshine. Plenty of grey skies around as well. Some really sharp showers. It's been blustery and cool. And in fact, we've got more of the same as we look towards tomorrow. It's going to be really blustery. Those heavier showers likely first thing. And by the afternoon, they should be clearing. The reason for that, one. Once the shower's clear, we've got a little ridge of high pressure, but these winds now are going to be coming from a northerly direction. So that's Saturday. It's going to be cold, clear and bright and hopefully a dry start to Remembrance Sunday. But eventually it will be turning a little bit wet as we head through the afternoon. Back to this evening, one or two scattered showers around. Again, quite sharp. It's a blustery evening. Uh, those winds gusting 30 miles per hour. But it is quite a cool night too, where you see clearer skies. Temperatures falling away to around 4 or 5 degrees. And perhaps dry first thing. But once again, we're going to be seeing further scattered showers during the morning. Heavy at times too. But they are easing. As we head through the afternoon, the winds go from a southwesterly to a northerly direction. So quite a cool day still. 9 or 10 degrees. And with those northerly breezes, it's going to be feeling even cooler than that and it stays quite blustery th during much of the day those winds eventually easing Friday over into Saturday with lighter winds and clearer skies it's a chilly night temperatures two or three degrees in towns and cities a touch of frost in more rural areas and for Saturday well there's not much going on on the map it's going to be clear lots of sunshine around it's a cool day and by the afternoon temperatures perhaps 10 or 11 degrees feeling a lot cooler than that and then eventually for Remembrance Sunday although it's a dry start during the afternoon eventually to turning wet but behind it some milder conditions very november yes, I know, isn't very it? november <laughs> bit of a mixed bag then <laughs> thanks rachel um, that's it from me and rachel and the rest of the team uh, ian palmer will be back with your late news at 10 30 bye bye for now